Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to our VIA Pioneer Speaker Series. My name is Ryan Nemec, and I'm happy to be your host for this monthly event. And as many of you know, this is a monthly event where VIA hosts one distinguished speaker uh, from somewhere in the world who is using VIA character strengths in some in-depth way. And we've been organizing this VIA Pioneer Speaker Series by tracks. So when we started this at the end of last year, we started with the track of coaching and counseling and brought in leaders, leading practitioners in those fields. Uh, and then it, and right now we're getting to the conclusion, the, the, the grand finale of the business track. And uh, in a moment here, I'll be inter introducing our very distinguished speaker to conclude and give us this wonderful grand finale uh, of David Cooper Ryder. Um, and before I do that, just a couple little uh, points to note about other things happening at VIA. On the screen here, you can see that VIA has been doing a number of different new initiatives with teamwork and bringing teams together and helping consultants who work with teams and helping management consultants and executive coaches and others who work uh, on teams and consult to teams. And so what we have here is a, a VIA Pro team report as well as a new VIA team course. And we just concluded our first round of the VIA team course. It's a, a three session course. And we'll be doing another one uh, led by Dr. Neil Mayerson uh, later this year. We'll probably be doing two more actually. So those are a couple things to, to make mention of. Uh, and also let me just back up here and let you know that uh, we have another course that's starting in the middle of August. It's what we think of as our, our flagship course. It's our general VIA course that goes into depth on the latest research and practice with character strengths. And we have people arranged in Skype groups, and you get various articles and, and lec uh, uh, lectures each week and so forth. So we hope that you'll uh, sign up for that course. You can find out more at viapros.org. Uh, and also, by the way, we have yet another course that actually starts today. So if any of you are into doing something last minute, we have a course that actually is a live interactive course. And actually, the, we got the uh, platform idea actually from our guest speaker today, from, from David Cooper, who told us about the Maestro platform. And this Maestro platform is this technology that allows people to be live in small groups and for us to put you in groups of two or three and then, and then we break back out into a main room and do lecture and then put you back in small groups. So it's this wonderful technology. We're so grateful that David introduced that to us. And that's a, a different course, different than what you see on the screen here, um, that actually starts today at 5 p.m. and it goes for four weeks. So if you want to know more about that course or if you want to register late, uh, it's a very small group. We keep it uh, an intimate uh, size. Uh, for, for more interaction. Uh, then you can, if you want to sign up for that, it's viapros.org. V-I-A-P-R-O-S dot org. So uh, without further ado, let me um, say one more thing, and that is if you'd like to ask any questions in the next hour, hour and 15 minutes uh, for David, then please email me. Uh, so you can email me directly at ryan at viacharacter.org ryan at viacharacter.org if you have any particular questions uh, for David Cooper Ryder or kind of general questions that kind of are elicited uh, on this topic uh, as you listen to him speak here. So let me say a little bit about our very distinguished speaker. I'm, I'm so happy and actually quite honored to be able to introduce you to David Cooper Ryder, who is uh, a Fairmount Minerals professor of the School of Management at Case Western University, uh, Case Western Reserve University actually in Cleveland. Uh, he, I could say so much about David. He's basically the, the founder of Appreciative Inquiry. He's the author of a number of different books on that topic. Uh, he's written a number of articles on the topic as well. He's consulted to, uh, uh, we, could, we could go on for a day of the different distinguished uh, individuals and groups and organizations that he's consulted to, whether it's uh, presidents or Nobel laureates or uh, entire cities, uh, leaders of countries, and on and on. And, and he's just done such incredible work in bringing forth this process called appreciative inquiry and bringing forth strengths into that process. And so uh, it's been uh, a while since uh, David and I got a chance to do an interview like this. Uh, David, you might remember a couple years ago at the International Positive Psychology Association Conference, we uh, had the, I, got, I had the privilege to be able to spend a half hour, 45 minutes interviewing you uh, on uh, strengths and on AI. And we actually have some of those clips on our 
via Strength's YouTube channel, which you can actually see uh, online as well. Um, so I'm very happy uh, to do this, and I, I hope we can maybe do it every year instead of every two years. But uh, without further ado, uh, I'm turning it over to you, uh, Dr. David Cooper Ryder. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, well, it's exciting to be with everybody here, and um, I look forward to make this next hour really count in terms of our thinking of ways to really expand and extend the, um, the VIA strengths, potentials, and capabilities. And I am especially indebted um, to the great conversations with Neil and Donna um, around uh, the VIA strengths. And it's really helped me in terms of thinking about my work with business and society. And Ryan, you're going to help me with my um, slides here today. Maybe we could go to the first slide here. OK. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so I have a couple points of departure um, that I'd like to just, and then, then we'll get into it. But um, I mean, as all of you know, um, the, the excitement around the positive psychology movement is really, really tremendously important. Um, I do think that it's a tectonic cha change in, um, in what we are looking at and paying attention to, and human systems move in the direction of what we ask questions about. It's one of the great principles of appreciative inquiry. You know, do I really want to do one more study of low morale in the companies I'm working with, or might the topic be um, human flourishing in the workplace? And those choices make such a difference in the social construction of our visions of what's possible, um, and, you know, certainly when Marty um, Seligman, you know, announced and christened the positive psychology movement, what an important moment that was in, in the history of psychology. Um, I just, my whole bookshelf has completely changed over the last five years. I mean, I just, I just love the, the works that, um, that are there, you know, the uh, one that I really especially like recently is Curious um, by Todd Keshiden. Um, just an amazing book about the role of curiosity in our lives and how that draws us into deeper connections and relationships and so on. And of course, um, research like Barbara Fredrickson's work and positivity and what good are positive emotions. And, and I think when you look at the early history of positive psychology, um, you know, what's certainly going to become a classic is the Via Strengths, you know, the, the book, um, Character, Strengths, and Virtues. Um, I know on the back cover of that book, Howard Gardner at Harvard said, you know, this endeavor to focus on human strengths and virtues is one of the most important initiatives in psychology of the past half century. Um, I'm pleased, he said, to have had the opportunity to make a small contribution. Um, well, I feel like, you know, what an exciting time to be in the li alive in the field of, my field is organization development and change, and, um, and with all this great research. So um, the question that I've been dealing with recently is around the question of positive institutions. If you remember when Marty began to articulate the three pillars of the positive psychology movement, the first was the study of positive human traits and strengths. Um, the second was positive human experience, like what good are positive emotions. And the third call was around the call to positive institutions. And I think to date, um, we're still um, needing a definition of what do we mean by positive institutions. Um, but um, uh, so I'm going to try and provide some theoretical bridges here today um, uh, across a number of different domains, but really begin to work with this idea of the discovery and design of positive institutions. But we need to know what we're talking about. So I'm going to offer some definitions. Um, in my own work, what I'm seeing is just huge, huge uh, applied potential. Um, and part of that is um, when we're able to marry the sustainability movement that's happening around the world um, in business um, and society um, with the positive psychology notions. And that's no small feat to begin to connect those conversations. Um, in our own work, the business case is getting tremendously strong for strength-based and positive institutions. Um, I'll share a story of a, of a company that 
had a tenfold increase in its revenues and earnings, and um, and uh, along with that, the engagement scores in the organization. So um, I think the business case for this, the design of positive institutions is getting very strong. Um, so we're not just talking about individual psychology anymore. We're talking about group and collectivity and moving to the question of institutions. Um, just by way of a little background, Ryan mentioned my work on appreciative inquiry. And um, my real passion in the applied part of appreciative inquiry, my real passion has been um, around developing new theories and stages in positive change, non-deficit change. Um, um, and and especially, well, when I meet with um, CEOs today and executives in every sphere, um, they're obviously all concerned about change, change this, change that, in this remarkably complex world that we're living in, demanding agility and demanding innovation and demanding um, rapid reconfigurations of strengths and so on. But um, but I, I, I in the past few years, I've seen that the senior leaders, their question has changed. And their question today is not so much a question of change per se, but it's the question of change at the scale of the whole. How do we move a whole 67,000 person telephone company together? How do we move a whole Northeast economic region together? You know, um, you know what I'm saying? So the, I think um, where my real passion has been is how appreciative inquiry can help us deal with this question of change at ever-expanding ever domains of the whole. Um, it's not enough just to change in parts of the system. And, um, and so I think that's going to be part of our um, approach when we get into the question of the design of positive institutions will lean heavily on what we're learning around especially large group appreciative inquiry methodologies. And then my last point of departure um, most recently has been um, our research um, is probably the largest appreciative inquiry we've ever launched where we are searching for stories of innovation at the intersection of business and society. Um, there, it is, it is extremely exciting. We've done over 2,000 interviews into the concept business as an agent of world benefit. You know, and it's a question. It's not an answer. Like often when I use that title to our research, people say, what, you know, in today's world with all our global issues and species loss and climate change and so on, are you, are you really saying business is an agent of world benefit? Well, part of what appreciative inquiry is saying is, yes, we need to raise the question, what does that look like? Where is it happening? What are the dynamics? What can we learn about the building blocks of building positive institutions at the intersection, in this case, of business and society? Um, so much of our work um, has been moving into um, really working with companies and organizations that are working on the sustainability agenda, becoming green, um, having tremendous social responsibility and social impact and so on. And so one of the findings I'm going to get into today is how um, it's, it's just been one of the observations, some of the most exciting work we've ever done with companies that are really, really going deeply into designing sustainable products and processes and greener options and so on. And what we're finding is as people use this kind of via strength-based approach to start designing systems that are, that are healthy for the planet and, and help create a better world, what we find is that the loop works backwards to create human flourishing in the workplace. That somehow, not you know, obviously we don't have an ecologically sustainable world right now. But working on it might be the most important, empowering way of bringing out the best in human beings that we've ever seen. So we're going to talk about uh, as people work on ecological renewal in our world, how the it works to bring out the best in their soul, the best in their character, the best in their vision, the best in their hope, um, and so on. So it, 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 it is exciting. And Ryan, maybe you can um, move to the next slide here. Um, so 
you know, again, often people say business as an agent of world benefit, you know, and David, you know, what we're reading about is the bankruptcy and the soul of business. And, and I do think that for a lot of us, you know, um, you know, as we've looked at at, at the last years and the, you know, the Bernie Madoff ethics and the loss of legitimacy of our big companies and our financial systems. You just mentioned the word, you know, um, Goldman Sachs and so on, and people, people really question um, and, 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 you know, the unthinkable seems to have been happening in terms of some of these major corporations going under. Um, very quickly in some cases, like Enron and Arthur Anderson, and then more recently some of the major financial institutions. So it's almost like we've been caught in this place between the unthinkable and the unimaginable. What is the way forward? You know, um, are our financial systems amok? Um, uh, 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 have they gotten way beyond what we as human beings can control and guide and so on? So um, and we can move to the next slide. So, so I think there's major questions here. And in some ways, it's almost like the Dickinson, um, you know, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Um, and in terms of the best of times, I have to say uh, the, the explosion of innovation that's happening that we're seeing, uh, as I mentioned, um, we've done over 2,000 interviews, and we're finding, for example, you know, as you as you go into, for example, the S. C. Johnson factory in Wisconsin, um, you know, you know, it's an example of a factory that's giving back more clean energy, more energy to the world than it's using. Um, how are they doing that? Well, they created a innovative process to take. Um, the methane from the waste dumps and create um, a, a, a connection to the factories where the factory is using this waste in a productive way. It's creating more than it needs, so it's giving back clean energy and good energy to the city. Um, you know, you were seeing just uh, incredible um, uh, stories around business as a force for peace in high conflict zones, business as a force for the eradication of extreme poverty, doing things. Um, to create dignified work and, and, and so on. Um, business as a force for eco-imagination. Um, and, uh, you know, I, at each time I, I, I find some of these win-win-win innovations beginning to emerge, I'm reminded of Joseph Campbell's notion about it's inspiration that moves us forward. You know, I feel inspired every time I, I step in and talk to one of these organizations. Next slide, um, Ryan, and I'll, I'll carry this notion forward. So here's one. This is from a recent trip um, to the Netherlands. And, um, and it's, you know, it's literally a company that's decided that the new business model of the future needs to be one where we're not just reducing harm, um, where we're not just doing things less bad for the environment, but can we design with the intention of actually creating good growth, growth that helps regenerate the future? Um, so this is an extremely, you know, I, I, I love this one. I, I, I bought a whole bunch of these gym shoes. Um, their tagline is shoes that bloom. Um, but. Um, but literally, what they've they've designed every part of. You could go onto the website. It's O A T shoes that bloom. Go onto a Google search. O A T oat um, shoes that bloom. But it, it it shows the power of design intention. You know, imagine you're a designer and 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 someone comes to you and says, "I'd like you to design a shoe that has no negative ecological impact. It's based on completely renewable resources. That it's designed in fact and produced in factories that give back more clean energy to the world that they than they use maybe solar. Um, that um, that." that there's no need for budgets because they're so healthy and good that you know, it creates its own buzz with young people. Um, but more than that, instead of something that adds to our landfills after, after they're done, um, you know, we'd like you to design it in a way that when you're done, you could go into your backyard and literally plant the shoe and it turns into an oak tree or some kind of tree. Um, you know, can you do that for me? Well, it's being done, and it's called Shoes That Bloom, and it shows the power not just of design, but 
you know, this whole notion that uh, design is the first signal of human intention. Can we design a world that has good growth, that has renewable growth, regenerative growth? Um, but the point from a human behavior and strength-based side, I'm going to come back to this one, um, is that what we're finding in these workplaces is people are alive, they're joyful, they're, um, they're filled with delight as they stumble upon these innovations. Um, and same thing, when I brought these home for Christmas time, um, for holiday season gifts at home, um, you know, I, I had a pair for Nancy and a pair for the kids and so on. And it's just so exciting to see when they open it up and they sense what we're capable of as human beings and get an image of what the economy can be and how business can be a force for, um, for good. So we'll go into the next slide. Um, and, um, you know, obviously under the rubric of sustainability, this is moving very, very quickly. I got my feet wet um, a couple years ago um, and I just didn't realize how fast this was moving. Um, but um, Kofi Annan, um, was was going to be hosting the largest meeting in the history of the UN with business leaders, with CEOs um, from corporations all over the world. And the way that this, um, and, and we got a call to facilitate that meeting. And um, one of the benefits of that was that it just gave me an inside bird's eye view of how rapidly this is moving and how much the media is missing it in some ways. But um, but what happened was in 2000. This was 2004 when I started working with Kofi Annan. Um, but in 2003, he was at the World Economic Forum, and this was you know shortly after Enron and WorldCom. So there were protesters at that World Economic Forum meeting, and you know they almost had to change the location of the meeting because there was going to be um, the possibilities of, of violence and things like that. Um, so it was it was a tense time and. When Kofi Annan got up, and so the World Economic Forum, um, um, it's it's a place where the CEOs of CEOs come. You know, Bill Gates was there, and all the different top top business leaders. And so it was Kofi Annan's opportunity and chance to speak to that group, and everybody expected him to kind of take um, take flight with the same kind of chorus of critique so many of the NGOs had and people who were losing their faith that business was out of touch with long-term societal needs. And Kofi Annan got up and he took a different stance and he said, you know, he said, he said, I think in the back of his mind, he's saying to himself, you know, we have these millennium development promises, for example, to cut extreme poverty in half by 2015 and so on. And, and I think in the back of his mind he said, saying, we will never be able to realize our millennium development dreams of eradicating extreme poverty without great new business efforts and models and dignified work um, and opportunity for people. We're never going to be able to deal with this massive transition we need to uh, create to a sustainable economy and ecology, um, especially like in the renewable energy spheres. We're not going to be able to do that with tremendously enlightened business leaders and investments in clean technologies. And, and I think in the back of his mind he was saying we're never going to be able to you know, um, um, create cultures of peace and justice. For example, in the Middle East, we're 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 never going to be able to do that unless we have great new business models that create dignified work and empowerment and equality and so on. So, instead of bashing and and joining in the chorus of critique against the business leaders, he reached out his hands that day and he said. Let us choose today to unite the strengths of markets with the power of universal ideals, and let us choose to reconcile the forces of private entrepreneurship with the needs of the great masses of humanity, billions who live on less than $2 a day. Let us choose. Well, with those words, and it was almost magical, he didn't have you know, a vision of a project, but several CEOs like Daniel Vesela, the head of Novartis, and a few others came up to Kofi Annan and said, let us sit down and really, as business leaders with the UN, create a new vision of business and society for the 21st century. And they did. They sat down and they crafted 10 beliefs and principles and dealing with human rights and ecology and the future 
of innovation in poverty-stricken areas and so on. And, um, and these principles, they were proud of these principles and they thought, you know what, let's see if we can build an alliance or an association of companies that are ready to advance these principles. And they were hoping maybe 50 big companies would be part of it, like Ericsson Phones and Tata Industries and Royal Dutch Shell and you know, um, uh, Microsoft and so on. Well, first there were 50, then there were 100, then there were 200, then there were 1,000. Nobody expected that kind of response. And, um, and so that's when Kofi Annan decided, well, we need to bring all these business leaders together for a global summit on this topic of business as an agent of world benefit and we got the call to facilitate that session. Again, my specialization is really large group strategic planning and and not just talking heads, not just um, pre-negotiated agreements, but real interactivity where you discover the strengths from the individuals to the groups and then to the whole collectivity and use that in an appreciative inquiry 4D cycle to um, discover and dream and design the future together. Well, in this case, they were designing the UN Global Compact. At that time, the UN Global Compact had about 1,200 corporations. Um, by the time we got to 2007, you can see on the right-hand slide, Ban Ki-moon, when he came on and took over from Kofi Annan, we all wondered, would this, would this great effort continue? Well, not only did it continue, but by now there were over 8,000 corporations part of this effort. And, and I have to say, my sense of what, what we're capable of as human beings just began to grow enormously as I sat with these very senior leaders talking about their visions of a better world and how business could play a role there. And, and it was profound, you know. So just as one example, at the 2007 meeting with Ban Ki-moon on the right-hand side, um, you know, I'm sitting at the table and here's Jeffrey Sachs right next to Ban Ki-moon. Jeffrey Sachs is the economist from Columbia um, who's written the book um, The End of Poverty and has shown economically how for less than, you know, he said all the solutions are out there now. Um, all we have to do is connect the dots and bring the strengths of various sectors together, um, government, nonprofit, and partnerships with business. And so, for example, one solution is called the Millennium Development Villages concept. And for less than $110 per person in a village, you can jumpstart the whole economic development and empowerment process where when you come back then, a year later, there are hospitals and schools and roads that have been built by the people through, um, through the, the dignified work that's been created. But he's pounding his table, Jeffrey Sachs is, and he's, he's saying, you know, we, everyone in this room, we need to wake up to the enormous capacity human beings have today. We can be, he said, the first generation in human history. Now think of that, the first generation in all of human history, we can be the first generation to completely eradicate extreme grinding poverty, you know, the kind of poverty that you and I um, can scarcely even imagine, but people living under those conditions. He said, think about what that means in terms of, you know, the next 30 years, what, we'll, what we will see in that domain and what we can accomplish. So then um, we turn to Jane Nelson. She's in the center there, and she's at Harvard. And, um, Jane is through the appreciative inquiry process, we're lifting stories of solutions and celebrating strengths and so on. And she said, yeah, well, the story I want to tell is about the great um, transformations in clean energy. She said, so for example, how many of you know nano solar? Not very many people did, but nano solar is a company that's been funded very heavily by the founders of Google. And she starts telling the story. They've got a proprietary technology now where they can spray on the solar cells onto something, solar cells, um, onto something as thin as aluminum foil. And they're in manufacturing stage now. She said, imagine the implications of being able to turn almost everything into a solar producer. You know, the spray paint on your car, um, the spray on, on, the, on, the, on the rooftops and so on. And she said, you know, you know, we, we, you know, I mean, she, she said, just imagine the kinds of innovations and possibilities we're going to see 
during the next 25 years. And at that point, the head of Coca-Cola, just above Jane, um, he was so excited. He, he stood up. He was uh, in front of the whole crowd of the 1,000 CEOs, and he pounded the table. And he said, it is time for all of us as CEOs to stand up, to step up, and to scale up. And again, that whole question of change at the scale of the whole. How do we introduce this whole renewable energy society, um, um, regenerative society, um, not just less bad, but a society where business is a force for um, a business as an agent of world benefit. So we can go to the next slide here. Um, but you know, for me, um, you know, in a in a in, in, a, in an important sense, I would I just want to say this. What a privileged time we are living in in the field of leadership and change and 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 especially where character strengths can surface to the fore and i 'm going to come back to that, but let me just show a quick little model in our two thousand interviews um, I may be quick at one more time um, Ryan in our two thousand interviews yep yeah, in our two thousand interviews um, what we 're finding is a definition. Chris Laszlo, one of my colleagues at Case Western Reserve University, um, is part of our center and he 's got a, a new strategy book out looking and helping to define what do we mean by sustainable value creation and um, and again we 're looking at companies that are managing social impacts in the positive way, environmental impacts along with their economic value. And um, and almost all of the stories are lining up in this upper right-hand quadrant. And um, it's nice um, strategy language for business strategy, but it's got two dimensions to it, shareholder value and stakeholder value. And traditionally, we measure the performance of the corporation through shareholder value. And that's been the predominant and, and dominant way of, of teaching and, and, and spreading management um, theory is, is by just focusing narrowly on shareholder value. What Chris's argument is, and others in organizational theory, is that we now live in a world where uh, of, of multiple stakeholders, not just shareholders, many, many stakeholders, stakeholders like the environment, stakeholders like communities that care about the value that's being created or destroyed, um, NGOs and nonprofits that care about the value that's being created or destroyed, the media, many, many stakeholders that organizations and business leaders have to pay attention to today. I can remember Lee Scott some years ago at Walmart um, just so many protests operating there. There was actually a network called Walmart Watch with a thousand NGOs who were kind of watching every move of Walmart. We live in this complex world where managers have to manage way beyond the bottom line. And so, um, so this, this kind of matrix begins to talk about the direction that we're seeing in the stories where there's a combination of tremendous shareholder value being created plus tremendous stakeholder value. Um, and it's an interesting combination if you think about it. So like at the upper top shareholder value, look at the, 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 the upper left quadrant. That's a, that's a situation where an organization might be making a lot of money for its shareholders, but it's destroying value in the eyes of stakeholders. So remember GE years ago with all of their toxins in the Hudson River, and that was at a time where the internet wasn't strong and companies would externalize those kinds of damages to society in almost a clandestine way. Well, you just can't do that anymore. Um, and, and we've seen GE move towards sustainability in a huge way. Um, so, so the idea here is that you can't have, you know, destroying value in the eyes of stakeholders, including the environment and so on, and shareholder value that's ultimately on that upper left that's unsustainable. The other unsustainable quadrant, the, the yellow one, is interesting as well. Um, and that's where you might have a company that's tremendous creating stakeholder value in the eyes of their communities, in the eyes of their, so for example, um, 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 National City Bank in Cleveland, um, prior to the banking crisis um, and financial crisis, they were the number one philanthropic business in 
Cleveland, you know, giving lots of support to the food bank and to um, children's education and schools and the arts. On, so on the right-hand side, they were creating, in the eyes of stakeholders, a lot of value. But they, on, on the lower bottom, um, they were losing lots and lots of shareholder value and ultimately went out of business. So their philanthropic impulse was not sustainable and that's an unsustainable quadrant that yellow quadrant um, you can't you, you know you, you can't take your eye off the business and then still be able to contribute philanthropically what we're finding is almost all the top rated stars in virtually every industry are starting to move towards this quadrant we call sustainable value um, and Chris Laszlo's term I think is really an important one it's value that's great for the world and quote value that's in the eyes of the world and and value that's great for shareholders in a logical business sense so you think about for example years ago companies used to just think about these social and environmental issues as kind of sidelines to the business, you know, a little bit of social responsibility on the sideline to the real core business. Um, so you think about it, you know, the year the year that um, General Motors, you know, well, think about the year when Prius came out. Everybody said the Prius, nobody's going to care about that ecologically advanced kind of a car and so on. But all of a sudden, it just created a huge wave of response. And Toyota executives were really thinking long term. You know, they were thinking, where is our Earth systems going? And how can we lay the groundwork? Well, at the same time, the same year that the Prius came out, guess what General Motors strategy thinkers were building? You know, not only did they not come out with something like the Prius, they came out with the Hummer that year. Now, you know, partly what was happening was a mindset. Executives used to think these issues of business and society were mere kind of philanthropic or social responsibility. We'll give that to our social responsibility department. They weren't seeing how that could be a source of imagination, like those gym shoes. You know, what a source of imagination and breakthrough innovation that could lead to win-win solutions. Um, so anyway, um, we'll go to the next slide. But that's kind of some of the strategy language around this. And just again, um, you know, these are just um, headlines about how fast this is moving. Um, global vehicle to grid market to reach 26.6 billion by 2020. Vodafone, Microsoft, other companies saved 33 million. Um, under their World Wildlife Partnership. Walmart unveils a sustainability tool and index that will be used with every product and all 65,000 of their suppliers. I helped them um, create that with um, an AI summit that we work with. Um, Hades, Inersa, this was right after um, the, 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 the hurricanes. Um, Haiti starts bringing its solar expertise to Africa. Smart meter shipments to top 100 million. Solar shares rise as Japan announces a $9.6 billion investment in solar. GE's eco-imagination revenues around the ecology, you know, hybrid locomotives and wind energy reaches $43 billion. Ten Honda plants achieve zero waste. Um, a lot of people said, oh, this sustainability language and, and so on was nice, but under conditions of the great recession that we've had, it's all going to go away. Well, it hasn't. There's something bubbling up, and I think it's one of the biggest shared agendas emerging in humankind's history. Um, one book called it Blessed Unrest. Um, anyway, um, the next slide. That's just, again, to, to, to share how quick this is moving. The business case is getting stronger and stronger. Um, one more click here. That will help be helpful. Um, business case is getting stronger and stronger. There's a recent book um, that you might want to get that kind of ties spirituality to all of this, um, but it's called Firms of Endearment, companies that are winning the hearts and minds um, of, of high engagement and, and doing better in the world and so on, and they're way outperforming over, a, you know, like the 15-year period of time. These firms of endearment um, on the left-hand side are outperforming the good to great organizations that Jim Collins studied. Um, the, the, the return on investments is over 1,600 percent with um, these firms of endearment, while the good to great were only 177 percent. So um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, all of this is to say um, 
uh, and this is just a slide that shows why these companies are creating more value, you know, because, you know, doing good for the environment is a way to mitigate risk. It's a way to reduce energy. It's a way to differentiate products like the shoes that bloom, enter new markets, and so on. Um, so this is kind of the strategy situation that, that, we're, that we're seeing in terms of business leadership. Next, next slide. Um, but the real question for all of you is, is how do we link positive psychology in business? Um, how, you know, how is it that we link this language, the positive psychology with the corporate strategy, with sustainability, with going green, with this tremendous revolution? How do we connect these two revolutions, the positive psychology revolution and the sustainability revolution? Right now, they are far apart. Um, there is not a lot of positive psychology work happening in this area. And I think in part it's because we still are searching for a definition of positive institutions. Um, next slide. Um, so, um, so here's the link. And I think that this, you know, I mentioned earlier that the book on character strengths and the Meyerson, you know, website on VIA and so on, I think it is one of the most potent piece of works um, in the last, you know, um, 50, last half century of psychology. And another reason why it is so important is that it's giving us a vocabulary that's going to allow us to create these linkages. Um, so you think of, you know, what you all know about as the 24 human strengths from wisdom and knowledge and courage and humanity and transcendence and hope and optimism and so on. Um, let me let me work with this and make this bridge. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, here's my working definition of positive institutions now, and I call and I'm linking three kind of domains: the, the what I'm calling the elevation of strengths, and then the concentration or combinations of strengths, and then the third, bringing our highest strengths out into the world. So positive institutions are organizations and communities and societal institutions that enable these three things simultaneously, the elevation and engagement of our highest human life-giving strengths, the connection within the organization, the new connections and combinations and ways of magnifying those collective strengths, like the AI summit, for example, when we bring 500 people in the room to create this concentration, combination effect of human strengths. And then ultimately the creation of strength-based institutions that refract, that push, that bring in a magnified way our highest human strengths outward into our world. Um, next slide. So, so let me give you an example. Um, and, and again, I've written an article recently called Three Circles of the Strengths Revolution. And I'm saying that, 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 that number one is not enough. You know, it's, it's, it's the beginning of the revolution. But the elevation of strengths is all the tools emerging in positive psychology, the VIA tools, um, recent book by my colleague um, Tojo Thatchenkerry called Appreciative Intelligence, how we get better at noticing and elevating strengths, seeing the true, the good, the better, the possible in each human being, and seeing the true, the good, the better, the possible in our teams, in our communities, and so on. So the elevation of strengths in those tools. The second circle is all about the concentration effect of strengths. You know, Peter Drucker's whole notion of leadership when he said the task of leadership is to create a connection, a combination, an alignment of strengths in ways that make a system's weaknesses irrelevant. So it's all about alignment of strengths. The AI Summit, doing planning with cities, for example, in groups of 500, 700. I just did a, a, an appreciative inquiry summit with the governor of Massachusetts to bring 300 energy institutions together to plan the future. But it all got started by elevating um, and, and, to, and looking at our signature via strengths. Um, and then networks and webs and tipping point dynamics. So there are lots of tools emerging there. And then thirdly is this design of positive institutions that create sustainable value, value that helps the, the, that brings um, regenerative forces to the world um, and multiple stakeholders and value to um, the world and also shareholders in a traditional business sense. So the next slide. Um, and I, I want to keep this moving, but here, let me, you know, sometimes people don't quite get it. What do I mean by a positive institution refracting 
and magnifying and bringing those magnified human strengths out into the world. But let me share just one example from our interviews of business as an agent of world benefit. And while I tell this story, make a check on your notes. Which strengths do you see? Which character strengths do you see um, being magnified and brought into the world through this story? Um, it, it was, it's, it's just each one of these stories, again, um, the, the notion that Joseph Campbell said, awe is what moves us forward. Well, every time I've done one of these interviews, I feel that sense of awe about what we're capable of as human beings. So um, this was a few years ago. I was on my way to Israel to do a talk um, at the Arison School of Business. They were dedicating a new building. And um, on my way, I stopped in Amman, Jordan, and met with the former prime minister. His name was Majali. And I met with him. Um, it was at a very tense time in the Middle East with Iraq and, and, and so on. And um, that, that evening, I just, I, you know, I didn't have a, the firsthand feel of the tensions in that part of the world. Until that morning, I woke up and um, and the headline news that day was that um, there was a biological weapon intended to kill about 150,000 people. Um, they stopped that plot, fortunately, but um, but still, I, I just as I thought about the implications in the world and the tensions and so on between peoples um, of all cultures there, and I and I I, I just. Uh, you know, I decided on my way to Israel on the plane, I changed the topic of my speech. I was going to talk about business and ecology. And um, in, instead, I decided to change the topic to business as a force for peace. Well, um, I didn't have a lot of data yet. I hadn't written on that topic, but I was just going on instinct. Um, and I raised the question. I started, you know, in that session. I said, you know, where's the peace going to come from in this part of the world? You know, I don't think it's going to come from our military. I don't think it's going to come from our paralyzed politics and governments. You know, I don't think it's going to come from our lawyers. You know, could it be that business could be the most important force for peace in this part of the world? And, you know, I didn't have a lot of data, but I had some data that showed that as um, peace um, as, as prosperity gets more shared, um, that conflicts go down and so on. So uh, I did, a, did the talk on that proposition. Afterwards, someone came up to me. At, we were having a reception, and an elderly man came up to me, and he tapped me on the shoulder, and he shook my hand. He said, David, you know, your proposition is right on. He said, he said I, I want to talk with you about this. Let me introduce myself. My name is Steph Wertheimer. He said, by the way, can you meet me at my helicopter tomorrow at 8 in the morning? And I thought, oh my gosh. I said, yeah, sure. I, you know, what are you thinking about? What's, what's, what's on your mind? He said, David, I want to take you to a very special place and share with you this story, what I call the miracle in Teffen in the Galilee region. So I met him at, at 8 in the morning. It was a um, spectacular day. You know, I met him by his um, helicopter. And we went up in the helicopter, again, just beautiful day. The Mediterranean was sparkling over on the left, and we, um, we, we flew and rose up. And as we were going in the helicopter, he starts telling me this story about how years ago, um, in the 1940s, when he fled fascist Germany, he came and he created his first business in this region called Teffen. Well, um, we, you know, you're flying over deserts. There's no natural resources, just a few goats on these barren hills. And all of a sudden, off in the distance, you see this beautiful, beautiful um, residential area. And, and not just residential area, parks and homes and businesses and a business university, a, 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 an incubator for entrepreneurial businesses. Um, and we, we, we come down and land on the landing platform. And he starts telling me the story. They've given birth to over 300 new businesses in the last 10 years. It accounts for 10% of Israel's export GNP. It's an amazing story from a business success perspective. Um, but then here's the kicker. It's all based on coexistence, co-ownership. 
between Arab and Jewish co-owners of all the businesses, co-owners of all the schools, co-owners of all the art centers and museums and so on. So here I am in this part of the world that everybody tells me it's intractable. The media says it's intractable, these ancient animosities and hurts and bitterness. And we go in, he, he takes us through the factories and, and you see all the collaboration. Takes me into a fourth grade class, 10 year old children Jewish and Arab, just holding hands, watching computer screens about how to take an idea, a business idea, and create an entrepreneurial setup and bring that idea into the world. And they were singing, and they were laughing, and they were joking with the cartoon characters of these business, um, new business startups and so on. And I was amazed. And I had shivers up my, my spine. And here I am again in this part of the world, and I'm seeing these children holding hands and singing and laughing and playing. And I thought, here I am in the university. I've done 2,000 interviews at business as a force for you know, ecological repair and regeneration and this and that. But I've never heard of this. I ask, I ask audiences, have you heard of this miracle in Teffen? Well, it's a great example not only of great business, like the one business they created called Iskar. Warren Buffett bought it said it was the best run business he's, uh, management that he's ever seen. Um, anyway, but as I talk about that story, what kind of character strengths are being spread into the world? You know, is it justice? You know, is it open-mindedness? Is it creativity? Is it courage? Well, what I want to illustrate here is that this is the way we can start talking about positive institutions. Positive institutions not only elevate individual strengths inside, not only create good combinations and collaborations of strengths inside, but they refract our highest human strengths and bring those highest human strengths in a magnified way into society. In other words, positive institutions are a huge step towards the good life, towards flourishing life, and so on. So next slide. So I think you get a sense of what I'm talking about there. Um, so um, many of you have read about appreciative inquiry. I'll just touch on a couple um, thoughts here. I'm going to move through these fairly quickly. But just a little bit about, OK, how do you design positive institutions then? Um, next slide. How do you deliberately work with these via strengths and so on? So let's go to the next slide here, Jason. So again, um, a, a lot of it rides on this task, on this strength-based philosophy. In my last conversation with Peter Drucker shortly before he passed away, he wanted to hear about the strength-based approach of appreciative inquiry and the many, many applications that he heard about from Fast Company and other kinds of things. At the end of the day, I said, but Peter, you've written more on leadership and management than anybody in human history. Can you put it in a nutshell? And he said, yes, David. He said, that's easy. The task of leadership is to create an alignment of strengths in ways that make a system's weaknesses irrelevant. And I wrote that down. You know, the task of leadership is to create an alignment of strengths so effective and powerful that it makes the system's weaknesses irrelevant. And the next slide. So what that raises, I think, for a theory of leadership is could it be in management and managing change and so on, and could it be that managing change is all about strengths, you know? Um, and if so, then we need some theories, you know? Why would strength connected to strength propel change? Why would hope connected to another person's hope propel change? You know, it's often been said that strengths perform like a great orchestra. But how about the idea that it's these combination effects that strengths do more than perform, they transform. It's the stuff of transformation. And so if so, what are the tools? How do we, you know, create an entire change theory? And can we introduce this concept that I'm calling transformational positivity? You know, can we consciously and deliberately create settings for this concentration of strengths in a way that ignites upward spirals of transformation. OK, next, next slide. Um, um, obviously, you know, um, for many of us online here, it's, it's obvious that this is the way that we should be going. Um, but you know, does it translate into business? So often, we find just the opposite, that, you know, that you know, again, when people are asked, to what extent do, does your supervisor see and play to your strengths every day in the workplace? Oh, only 20% of the world's 
people say yes. Um, so we need to reverse this 80-20 data set. Next page, or next slide. Um, um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip a couple here so that we can leave some time for some conversations. But I just want to say, you know, the deficit-based theory of change is so embedded. You know, um, where the Gallup organization, a 1.5 million person study, they said most theories of change end up with this assumption: let's fix what's wrong, and we'll let the strengths take care of themselves. You know, and that's just the opposite of what Peter Drucker was saying, it isn't it? Where he said the task of leadership is to create this alignment that's so strong that it makes our weaknesses a footnote. So um, what we tracked years ago, I started noticing when I'd give people a case study on IBM or something, everything was problem-oriented. I'd say, please do an organizational analysis, and they'd come back. Dave, here's the biggest problem we see at IBM, you know. And then they'd say, then we decided to go beneath that problem to the root causes. And then we started brainstorming possibilities. And then our treatment or our plan, well, next slide, uh, or next click. Um, what I realized years ago is that we were just stuck in this, what I call the deficit-based theory of change, based on this root assumption that institutions you know, that the world is a problem to be solved. If that's the root identity, then what does it mean to be a good manager? It means they have great tools for problem analysis. What does it mean to be a good consultant? It means to be able to diagnose the real problems. And the next slide, please. Um, so what we started saying in our work was, wait a second, organizations aren't problems to be solved. That's not what they are. You know, no organization was created as a problem. It's just the opposite. Organizations are solutions to celebrate. Um, they're centers of human relatedness that, um, that have infinite imagination, infinite potential, and infinite capacity to connect to strengths universally. Um, and so we realized there was, it was time for a shift. And we started saying, what happens if we start looking at our organizational organizations not so much as problems to be solved, but centers of mystery and miracle and, you know, a coming together of human relatedness. And I love Einstein's second quote, there's only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle. The other is as though everything is a miracle. But I also realized how incongruous that felt to say that institutions are miracles. But when you think about the miraculous, you know, institutions are places where we come together to learn how to apply our character strengths, how to cooperate, how to love, how to create institutions and legacies and so on. Institutions are places of human development. And so this shift was important to us um, in our work with Appreciative Inquiry. Next slide. Um, so um, what's emerged for us over a period of time is how to work with organizations to um, create that discovery of everything that gives life to that living system when it's most alive. The core question of appreciative in inquiry isn't what's wrong or right, but what is it that gives life when this organization is most alive? Um, using that material then to begin to imagine and dream and create such attractor possibilities that the whole begins to come together with a new hope and a new sense of possibility. Third phase is adopting design thinker tools, like the designers who created that shoes that bloom. You know, how do they think? How do they build such creative ideas? Well, we're bringing a lot of design thinking into our design phase, and then the destination phase of building organizations and institutions that continuously see the true, the good, the better, the positive deviation, and utilize and harness all of that good stuff for positive transformation. And so the next slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, our favorite way of doing appreciative inquiry is in whole system configurations of strengths. Um, and here's a series of success factors in large group planning that we've discovered and others have discovered. And this whole system in the room is very exciting. So if we're working with a trucking company, for example, we'll make sure the dock workers are at the strategic planning. We'll make sure the customers, external stakeholders, we'll make sure that supply chain partners, that community, um, that, 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 that future young people who might work there. So we bring the whole system into the room for a real task-driven 
process, typically three to four days, um, 300 to 2,000 people. And um, because of this almost concentrator effective strengths, we're just finding incredibly exciting results. Um, next slide. Um, uh, so, for example, at the first one we did like this, Rodrigo Lores, he brought 1,800 people together in Brazil to plan the future of nutrimental foods. Um, this story became legendary in Brazil, 300% um, increase in profitability and so on. It all started with inquiry into elevating everyone's strengths. Um, so let's go into the next slide. Um, what, we're, what we're studying now is why is it that this concentration effect and setting for creating this strength-based combustion. Why does it bring out the best so quickly? Why does it propel innovation and new life? And why is it so easy? Um, next slide. So here's an example, Fairmont Minerals. Um, it's our next stage in the AI Summit. We're calling it the Sustainable Design Factory, where people from all levels, we can go to the next slide, come together to design the sustainability agenda and the green agenda and the social impact and social responsibility agenda. In this case, at Fairmont Minerals, we had all of these stakeholders in the room learning about what sustainability is, learning how to use it as a innovation engine to open up imagination. We had customers, suppliers, NGOs, you know, external groups from the sand mining company. We had, they have protesters when they open new mines. So we invited protest groups into the room. The concept here is whole system. We had neighbors and board of directors and operations, customer service, logistics. And it was so exciting. Um, next slide. Um, yeah. Next slide, um, some of the highlights from the launch of their sustainability effort. Um, their, um, their, their, their growth rates drop, jumped to about 40% annual growth in earnings per year, but within two years after the summit. Um, and um, we can go to the next slide. But more important than that, within two years, they became the number one ranked corporate citizen in America. Um, the energy in their organization. So this was when we started to look at the human side. What happens when people are involved collaborating to build a better earth and a better you know, um, climate system and, and, and better you know, um, energy systems? You know, when people start working on building a better relationship with nature, what we were finding then is huge correlations. Engagement scores went way up. High quality, life-giving connections where people are listening and loving and collaborating and innovating and their creative involvement and imagination. Ante Glavis uh, was one of our doctoral students who captured this um, part of the Fairmont story and especially their journey towards becoming ranked the number one corporate citizen in America. But it was very exciting to see the human dimensions here as well on how you know, it just began to dawn on me. I've, I've been part of the field of management for many years, and I've seen many, many innovations come, like the quality circles and so on. But I've never seen anything in the whole field that brings out the best in people and the best in human character quicker than when they're working to build a better world. All of a sudden, they are inspired. All of a sudden, they come up with innovations. Like at Fairmont, they came up with a, a they said, well, how can we use our highest strengths to serve the developing countries? And they said, well, why don't we build a prototype of a $10 sand water filter to clean the drinking water in poor countries? You know, and maybe, um, maybe we can do that in a way that opens up, obviously, new business opportunities for us, but do it in a way where there's no moving parts, where it cleans the water for a family, where their children are sick and can't go to school because of um, poor putrid water. Anyway, they are operating in 44 countries now after they prototyped and built that sand water filter. And they're so proud of their work. So the engagement goes up, the high quality connections go up, the sense of purpose and creative involvement. And Ante is doing great work um, tracking this um, kind of the reverse impact, not how do we become better at helping the world, but when we do help the world, how it brings out the best in human beings. So the next slide. 
Um, yeah, so these are just a few other examples of the AI summit in action. The do good, do well was the phrase that they came out of their summit with at Fairmont Minerals. Um, Cleveland, the city of Cleveland, the mayor decided that we need to spend 10 years um, creating a new concept of the economy with urban farms, with offshore wind energy. So that's called, um, it, it's an appreciative inquiry summit process, bringing 700 business leaders and nonprofits and university leaders and young people together, 700 people together in the whole system AI strength-based approach every year for the next 10 years. It's called in Building a Green City on a Blue Lake, and it's an amazingly exciting venture. Um, I mentioned on the bottom left, Ban Ki-moon, and our work with Ban Ki-moon um, following Kofi Annan. That whole um, UN Global Compact is growing and growing, as well as what we came up with with them at one of our sessions on business as an agent of world benefit came up with a set of principles for leadership schools called um, um, called the, the principles for responsible business leadership. So it's now in our business schools. The bottom right is another AI summit. Um, this is the one I mentioned with 600 or seven no about 300 energy institutions um, working on clean renewable energy visions and strategies for the whole state of Massachusetts. Um, next slide. What I'm seeing in each case is how the very, very best in human systems comes out. Um, and, and there's two ways that VIA is playing a huge role here. Um, we're going to, uh, uh, at the Fowler Center for Sustainable Value, we're going to be doing a special issue of the Journal of Corporate Citizenship. Um, the special issue title is going to be The Positive Psychology of Sustainability, How Sustainability Creates Human Flourishing, Brings Out the Best in Human Beings. And then a white paper just developed by Chris Laszlo and others, Dave Sherman, Yuma Barros, um, Judy Brown, John Ehrenfeld, Mary Gotham, Paul Werder, they've just developed a, a great white paper on the need to even change our language now. It's not about sustainability, doing less bad, giving us sustainable society that can at least exist and survive. That's not what the goal is, but the goal needs to be around flourishing. Next slide. And this is, um, uh, 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 and then I want to open it up for any questions that you have. But here, um, building on their model, and I want to end with some additions to this model that I've given it um, as it relates to why VIA is so important in all of this. Um, so um, sustainability began um, um, some years ago. Like think of General Motors when they came out with the Hummer. They were thinking of sustainability as a cost. They were thinking about it as an obligation. Let's have a small social responsibility department. Um, they were um, you know, seeing it more as charity and not a way of doing the core of the business. But almost every business, it was, it was like that. And, and still today, it, sustainability is seen as a cost, as an obligation, as a have to, as a, a moral obligation, and not as an inspired core part of a DNA of business. So the next click here on that slide. Um, so then we moved into sustainability and people started seeing profit opportunities like GE said, you know, Jeff Imelt said, okay, wait a second, you know, um, if we reduce waste, all waste is a cost, maybe that will save us money. Um, and so a lot of companies started bolting on, what Chris Laszlo calls bolted on sustainability, where they would do one good thing, you know, like maybe have a great recycling program or whatever, and think that that's their sustainability, but it was bolted on, again, not part of the consciousness of business as a innovation, as a responsibility, as an embedded kind of thing. Um, and at the worst, um, you've got a lot of companies doing greenwashing. Like, which company isn't going green today? Um, and so it's really hard to sort out what's real and what's not real. And there's a real threat right now um, to the companies that are doing really good work, especially these companies that just see it again as a little bit of a sideline to the business, something that can add to profit. So therefore, we'll do it. You know, um, we'll, we'll try and you know transform our waste into something that's more profitable. So the next click, the next click, 
is companies that are now embedding this mindset, this, this wholeness, that we are part of the world, um, embedding it where they're saying, no, with good innovation, there doesn't have to be. We should never be um, you know, hurting the environment, but more than that, why don't we create shoes that bloom, that regenerate, that help build delight and excitement and, and a sense of you know, um, um, uh, you know, joyfulness. So, um, so more and more, um, there's companies that are doing less harm. You know, announcing major goals like ten Honda plants that say we're 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 going to build plants that have not just less harm, but you know, absolutely do no harm that have zero ecological footprint. Um, and so they're thinking of some of their legacies in that way. And then the next click. Um, then this whole quadrant that I talked about from Chris Laszlo's strategy work on sustainable value, where it's value being created that's good for the world and good for the business. But now I think here's where we're heading in the next stages of this. My colleagues have called for, you know, we need a new language. So the next click. The next click, I think, where the whole field needs to be heading is coming together with positive psychology. Um, and again, it's partly a shift to start saying, we're not about just the study of less bad. We're also about the study of genuine flourishing, the genuine flourishing of all life, of human beings, and so on. What does it look like? Where is it happening? So when I use the term business as an agent of world benefit, it's a study for the positive deviations that are beginning to emerge that allow for the flourishing of our organizations and our world. And I think the bedrock capability and the way that this goes deeper, I think at all the levels below this, companies launch their sustainability efforts with a lot of fanfare, and then they don't take it to the deeper human character strength level, where we really have a language about justice, a language about wisdom, a language to talk about you know, all of the things that the via character strengths are about. We need to recover and deepen the capacity for that kind of development if sustainability isn't going to exhaust itself. Because it's not always going to make money. But, um, but we need, with the deeper character strengths and explorations, um, that's, what, that's where we're heading here. So I want to thank Chris Laszlo and Dave Sherman and others for these stages that I see happening. And I also want to thank um, you know, the, 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 the VIA Institute um, and the Meyersons in particular for their tremendous commitment, not just to human strengths, but to the deeper human beingness, you know, the deeper development of character. And that's where I think this field is heading. Let me open it up for a few minutes and just see if there might be some questions emerging. Ryan? Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, David. Uh, such such visionary work here. And so, so one question here is, um, You've offered huge amounts of, of thought leadership and big picture thinking and visionary work here. What, what would you suggest it kind of bring it to, to like just maybe some of the individual practitioners on the call? What would you say are sort of one or two or three next steps? Like how do we take this material or one piece of this material or some of this material? What would you offer as sort of advice or counsel for two or three practical next steps? Yeah, yeah. Well, on the strength-based side, I think, um, I think we've got we've done really good work at um, at bringing the philosophy to individuals and HR departments and the talent departments and so on, and even you know individual development workshops, leadership development workshops. Where I think the field needs to go now is all about whole systems of strengths, um, not just internal to the system, but also bringing those strengths into society with some longer term vision of the new relationship between institutions and societies. Um, we, are, uh, we're, we are a society of institutions. And so to talk about strength-based institutions and have some methods for the discovery and design of positive institutions, I think that's where we're heading. So the language of sustainability helps, the language of, of positive psychology can be linked with that, but it gives us a north star now. I think we're working from the individual 
to the whole system, to the system in relationship to the world. And with that comes a lot of hope in our human ca capabilities um, because I think if we can harness institutions like this, then we can make this transition that we have to make as a human family in the next 25 years. Great. So, so you're saying that you would suggest individuals who are maybe consultants or who are for working for their own institution to, to find ways to bring character strengths to the institution as a whole would be one piece. And then another piece is to help that institution come together and to design methods that are more towards strength-based and sustainability and positivity? With via character kinds of strengths and the capacity to talk that way, like when I go and do some teaching in our masters in positive organization development, for example, and people after they've taken via strengths, when I tell stories then, like the miracle and toughen story, and I ask them to write papers on these businesses that are doing good in the world, their papers are so much better because they're able to talk the language of justice and love and humanity and um, and and curiosity and all of the human strengths. So uh, Wittgenstein said, the limits of language are the limits of our worlds. If we don't have that language and the nuances behind that language, we won't talk about it and we won't call for it. So um, this is a, a, an incredibly important um, link pin that brings um, these domains together. Great. And here's another question. Uh, how about um, you had mentioned um, with government? It, any would, would any particular tips in bringing character strengths into government? Like you mentioned, you're working with um, the government of Massachusetts, and anything in particular you'd offer people there? Well, just as an example um, of how we bring it into in the stages of a planning summit, you know, before we start developing the stri strategies for the future um, energy system. Um, which they're doing fabulous work. They're now ranked the number one state in the country for their energy efficiency programs and for their long-term vision on clean renewable energy. And companies like National Grid, for example, that sees the importance of bringing citizens together with government and so on. So p part of it is this um, um, government, uh, you know, government and citizen and business, private sector coming together in partnerships to do this planning. But, you know, from the very start of a meeting like that, we're trying to bring out the best in the system. So we ask people, one of the key questions in appreciative inquiry is the high point moment in their career where they felt most alive, most engaged, most impactful in their career. You know, you know, you know um, Ryan, tell me a time. There's been ups and downs and high points and low points in your career in trying to build a better energy system. Tell me the high point moment in your career. And as people in pairs start telling that, those stories, we have them with another sheet next to them have the via strengths where they can listen to the story from that person and help them surface what strengths they see in that person. Well, that creates an incredible bonding right off the bat. People start seeing and having a language to talk about the best in each other. And that sets the stage then for later to talk about our community and collaborative strengths, and then ultimately about our shared common grounds and strengths and why we are ready to take more heroic actions in the face of the environmental needs um, later on at an institutional level. But it starts in that micro moment of people learning who each other is in a human sense. And this is a really rapid way and very, very tangible way to bring this into a planning process as technical as building the energy plan for Massachusetts for the next three years. Yes, yes. And maybe one final question, um, a little bit more personal, but I know I myself and I know many people on the call, I'm positive, are, are curious about your strengths. and. Um, you know, you, you, with all these examples and all that you've done for, to help the world and to bring forth this, you've just displayed so much courage and, and so many other strengths. I wonder if you could speak to your highest strengths and how you bring them forth. If you do this consciously, if it just is sort of unconscious at this point, if you could just share whatever you would like along those lines. Yeah, that's interesting. So say it again, Ryan, just, you know, what 
<laughs> sure. If you, yeah, well, kind of the first part of the question was if you could share your highest strengths and and then how you you know do you consciously bring those forth in your in your work and around the world and in the consulting that you do and the writing that you do or you know is it sort of just coming out on them almost unconsciously at this point just so naturally because you're so tuned into what's right and what's good and positive methods and strengths. And, say that, um, you know, I think there's a, a couple of strengths from each of three areas that are, that are there the most. And um, in the wisdom and knowledge care category, I think curiosity, what I find is that unless I'm doing appreciative inquiry, really searching for the best in the systems that I'm working with, you know, and, and I'm curious, and I, and I come away delighted like I did with those shoes that bloom. If I don't have those feelings of curiosity and zest and you know love of learning, um, then my work is not as good. So I know that I need to continuously find ways not just to be doing speeches, but to literally be going into these systems and asking positive questions. Where is it best? What does it look like? Um, and so on. So the curiosity, love of learning. The other is transcendence. Um, I think that you know I do my best work when um, when I can get back to this notion of the miracle of life on this planet and where and 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 when I feel that and what are the conditions that allow me to you know go into an organization and say this organization isn't a problem to be solved but a miracle you know of human interaction a gift so you know what is it that makes it work and alive and so on. So I think appreciation of, of, of beauty, the openness, it's almost like um, my son recently writing a paper um, based on his, you know, kind of looking at some of our work on appreciative inquiry, and, 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 and he's calling it kind of a mystical pragmatism, like a combination of William James pragmatism, but maybe the most pragmatic element of pragmatism is the experience ability to open ourselves to such brightness in the world and where and how and, and and those things of value worth valuing that it's almost like a mystical experience that leads to new imagination and so on so and then the last I, I would say um, the category of courage um, you know I, I I think that all of us are being called into leadership beyond our competencies. And some of us are saying yes to that and throwing ourselves into some complex situations that are beyond our capabilities, but the world is saying we need to learn how to do this. You know, I was very scared at that first meeting at the UN, you know, the uh, thousand business leaders around, you know, they looked at me and said, David, are we really going to do appreciative interviews and you know uh, and so on. and I and I just had a trust in the process but how much good could come out if we gave them full voice and didn't have just speaking heads and so on so our, our world is calling for us to come together across boundaries sometimes scary boundaries we brought protesters into the room there were protests protesting the fact that big business was talking with Kofi Annan but um, so I think it does take courage and a belief in, in just what we are capable of as human beings when we get over our fears of separations and silos and we have the courage and the sense it's all going to come out all right if we create this wonderful combination and concentration effect of strengths. Um, I wrote a recent paper in Org Dynamics called The Concentration Effect of Strengths. And um, I think if people want to go to the, um, the website, I think I've got listed there where they can download that article. But, um, but you know, again, we're all being called beyond our competent competencies. I like Meg Wheatley's definition of a leader, by the way. She says, a leader is anyone who wants to make a difference at this time. And I, and I believe, you know, that's you, that's me, that's everybody on this call. Um, and so, anyway, those are the ways some of my strengths play out.
Well, thank you so much, David. And, and really, on behalf of everybody listening here, everybody who will be listening to the recording over the years, um, we're very grateful that you are putting forth your best strengths. And you're an incredible human being and doing incredible work around the world and for so many different people. And and the the measurement of the effects is, is really going to be impossible because it's going to be so grand and is so grand. So so my deep, a deep bow of gratitude to you for, for all that you do and and for your great thought leadership and for your, your, your personal touch as well. And, uh, and thank you for making the time to be able to, to speak to everyone here at VIA. You're welcome, Ryan. And thank you to Neil and Donna and everybody at VIA and, and to everybody participating. I, again, I think the next 25 years are going to be so enormously exciting. And especially as we bring this work of building a better world together with positive psychology, through the discovery and design of positive institutions. Um, I, think, I think what we're going to see in the next 25 years is just incredibly exciting. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much again uh, to Dr. David Cooper, Ryder, and thank you to all of you listening in on the call. Make it a great, wonderful week. Bye-bye.